Put the mic on me, go ahead, man. I'm rolling. I'm sitting here on top of the world right now with Mr. Huey P. Moe, the crazy Cajun, the leading Texas independent record producer, raconteur, hustler, go and get him. Sage, and all around uh, uh, cat in the record business. Send the check on time. That's number one. Send the check on time. That's right. <laughs> Call me what you want. Send the check on time. Now, he's got all these descriptions. Uh, the main thing is that he, he's well recognized as an uh, uh, important person in, in the formation of Texas music over the last 50 years, 20 years. 99. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> Since, it, since uh, recorded music began. And uh, uh, I guess uh, well, we, where we should start is... Uh, the young Huey Mo, how, do, how does a man like you, uh, a record producer, get started? Where, where does it all begin? That's something I don't really know because <clears throat> I didn't even know they had such animals as, as the music business or record business. I, my daddy played the accordion, couldn't read and write, and um, um, he was uh, just like any musician that ain't got no work, he'd sit there and play and look out the window to pass the time over when he got lonesome. And of course, me and my little brother was on the floor, and we had to listen to the card in one way or the other, whether we liked it or not. So I guess he must have pipelined that stuff in my ear some kind of way or the other. And, uh, well, you, you say accordion music. <clears throat> uh, you grew up in, in Kaplan, Louisiana, you were born? Right. Mm hmm. A town called Wright. I say Kaplan because it's Wright, W R I G H T. It's really not a town, it's just kind of suburbs there. And, uh, so I was in Kaplan, Louisiana. How many people in that town? Oh, uh, Including the mayor, it's probably 400. <laughs> uh, it's a rice mill town. A rice town? Rice town, yeah. All, all the folks were into the rice business oh, one yeah. way or another. All la labor people in the in rice mills, that's what you got there. And what did, you, what did your dad and mom do at that time? Well, b back in them days, my dad uh, worked for the uh, for the man, you know, who had the, uh, the rice. We picked cotton and hoed and, uh, and grew rice and, and shucked it and harvested. And that's what he did. We lived in there. A shotgun house. We had four little shotgun houses and two sets of blacks, and we were two sets of whites. So we worked for the man. About in fact, the James' name was James Baker, and I couldn't speak any English at all, and he couldn't speak. His son couldn't speak any French, and uh, I learned my English from him. He learned French from me. He speaks better French than I do today. <laughs> that's what I learned my. So when you started playing the accordion, this was this was at weekend dances. Uh, around but my dad Canada? did. My dad did. I never did play nothing any good. I played, tried to play the drums. They were no good. Mm -hmm. But my dad did, and um, I I learned from you know, uh, I guess from having music around the house all the time. He played all the time. He was a guy that guy. He couldn't read and write. Till he died, he couldn't even sign his name. And my mother had been to the eighth grade, and so she had to carry the pack. But the, the uh, uh, he was just uh, just loved music. Loved music. This Didn't make no different kind. This is Pappy Titan mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, uh, he's, he died about ten years ago. He recorded primarily French music. Yeah. He yeah, but French. you know he, he you know I, I get around that story. The, the, the worst feeling I've ever had in my life is I, I long after I'm getting ahead of long after I got into recording business. You know I never did ever think of my daddy wanted to record. I always told everybody else and recorded everybody else and. And the worst feeling I guess I ever had was when one day we were riding around the, around Port Arthur. He said, "You know, it's your son." So I would ask you one thing for our dad. And I figured he wants a new car, or, you know, a new house, a new car. Didn't you know? He said, "I'd like to make a record." And I'll never forget the man. My tears rolled down my eyes. It broke my heart because I never dreamed. I was too close to see the trees. I you know, forest for the trees. I never dreamed my dad even wanted to record. I never gave, gave him that chance, and then finally we did an album on which you have, and, and I guess it's my greatest pride and joy out of all my lifetime, because I got to fulfill that before he passed away. But I never, it, it can go to show you how you live so fast, and you never take time to smell the roses, right? And that's what was happening to me. Your dad played in, in a band, and uh, uh, you ever play with him? Did yeah, you I played with drums. Him? <clears throat> I played the spoons, we used to call them, you know, mm -hmm. with him, and we're just three pieces, and we'd play house dances, like on a Saturday night, because everybody worked in rice fields and stuff, cotton fields in the, during the week, so we played, they, they would take uh, all the furniture, and they would put it in one room, and people would come in and dance, and they'd, and, uh, you know, when it passed 10 cents around them days, it was big money, 
And uh, my dad and all of the neighbors that would make their own beer, and they would cool it off by digging a six-foot hole inside the bowl on the ground, and let it set in the ground because the ground is cool. You know? And them days, got to remember, there wasn't no electric ice box and stuff. So that uh, they would keep that beer, and sometimes it, it would go to blowing up, you know, because it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't seasoned yet, you know, and they'd cap it. <laughs> it sounded like, like a machine gun or something going off. But that's where we'd get that old beer, they'd open it up, and that old blue smoke would come out of it, you know, and then take two minutes and put you away, you know. <laughs> But it's good stuff. <laughs> so, so that's it. <clears throat> we play what we call house dances, and, and people would pass their hat around. Sometimes you'd get uh, uh, food. Uh, and somebody would cook a cake, and they would pay the musicians with, with what they could make at home because there was no money. So that's where we, you know, I learned things about dances. I remember them taking us to dance in the, in the in the wagon, and it was in in the buggies, horse and buggy. There were no cars back in the swamps in them days, and the only car I rem ever remember seeing, the first one was a postman. And we could see the dust coming a long ways off. It was a dirt road, and all the kids would run to the fence, you know, because, boy, it was something else. You'd see a car, you know, a plane or anything like that. So we, uh, but we'd always go to dancing buggers and, and wagons. And it would take forever to get there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> they had, I remember that the mamas used to put all, they had, one room where they had kind of bins, like you go to the grocery store, and then you see your lettuce and tomatoes and stuff. And these bins where the mamas would put the kids at. <laughs> you put them in there and bring up blankets and lay them all in these little bins around the room like that. And a couple of mamas would stay and watch the kids while the rest of them went and danced, you know. And they would take turns, you know, at that. And maybe that, maybe that my music goes back to the time I was laying one of them little bins. I probably loud enough I could hear it over there. Probably liked it. I grew, you know, piped it in some kind of way. Well, did you travel out of Kaplan with your dad when he, when he played, or did was no, it mainly it, around there? No, it just area? mainly around. It was in the swamps. You, did, you never got out of there. You just stayed down there because it didn't have the interstate tents. Didn't have the highways, and, and everything was mud and water and. And you, uh, you just, uh, that's why there really had no cars in there, because cars couldn't really go down off the main road. Mm. You, stayed, uh, you stayed on the main road if you had a car. And so that we'd, uh, my dad would get drunk, and I remember he had, we had an old red horse called Bill. And you've got to try and, in your mind and visualize that you can't, there's no lights. A hundred miles, you can't see no lights in them days because it was kerosene. And that, Going home in the dark, there wasn't no light. You just so my dad had that old horse train where he'd just go to sleep and we'd all go to sleep. And he'd let Bill just and when he when he get to that <laughs> gate, he'd stop. Might have been five, ten miles away. You know, it took us half the night to get back from a dance or something. But Bill, when the bill, when the wagon or the buggy would stop, we knew we was home. And that's where the old saying that you hear, "Put a light in your window at night." comes from because you you there was not a whole lot of fences and things and and you guide your way by light or somebody or my old grandma somebody would put a kerosene lamp in the window and you could see that way across the prairie then you knew you was heading that way you know <laughs> that's where that people uh, <clears throat> I always like to make an expression and that for for the people of today the kids of today because they don't know what you mean by the old light in the window you know most of the time I like to make a nerd that's a little nasty, but I got to put it on there while I'm here. Is that when we used to go, the old saying that I still use sometimes is uh, when somebody's doing real good, say, boy, you shouldn't have been high cotton, man, you know? <laughs> and I, I want to tell you where that came from, so that uh, for your your kids' sake, after I'm going, is, is in the days when you used to plant cotton, we plant cotton and actually would grow up, and then every six inches you'd hold and you'd leave one fine cotton stalk, you know, so it wouldn't be too close together. So uh, there was maybe a 20 acre farm of this, right? <clears throat> and we was holding cotton <clears throat> and the plants and you kid you back by that the next morning you couldn't hardly get up out of bed, man, because you were, I mean, no matter who you were. But there always come a time people gotta use the restroom, right? So where are you gonna use the restroom? It's just flat twenty acres and nothing but cotton that high, right? So in them 20 acres, there was always a spot where a lot of cows used to stay and lay down, or there was an old barn, old homestead. So the cotton where that old fertilizer was always grew taller, right? <laughs> so every time you could find a spot to do your number ones and twos and, 
and and find a hot cotton. That's where the saying came from. That's why I wanted to put on your face. So that peeps, boy, oh, he's shitting in hot cotton. You know, he's like he's got a Cadillac, a uh, Mercedes. He's doing the old saying. That's where it came from. Because if you could ever find your spot, because everybody see you. You know, and so if you find your spot where the cotton will grow faster, because more fertilized there, you know, we kind of curve your arms up your head, you know. <laughs> That's where that saying come from. <laughs> <laughs> well, when when did you first discover that there's more to music than getting up there and uh, playing an instrument? That there's people collecting money at the door. Well, I didn't, you know, I I didn't discover that till I got into the uh, disc jockey and and uh, and uh, naturally was running the barbershop then and winning and all that stuff. But I didn't discover that till till uh, we got popular on the radio show. Me and my dad and stuff on Saturday afternoons and. And because uh, I didn't think, you see, I didn't think that that people were supposed to pay to get paid to have fun. It still amazes me today, you know. And, and of course, you done been in the business and everything too. But it still amazes me today. Why should I get paid when I make somebody happy with my songs and my arrangements and my singers? Why should I get paid for that? It's a joy to my heart when I see people dancing to my stuff. Uh, it feels good when I see somebody give my act a big hand, a standing ovation, when I see them on the, the television shows and stuff like that. It just feels good. So I'm often, it's still the day that bothers me why people should have to pay for that. And back then, it's what it was. I didn't believe that you were supposed to make money to have fun, you know. I thought to have fun was free. Uh, um, and I guess it's probably what made me get into making money as the years went by, because I thought of the, the fun first and the money last, you know. Uh, I always thought if I'd make good music and so I could have fun by it, my friends could have fun by it and would enjoy it, then I guess money will come when it's supposed to. And I still believe in that. I believe if you if you do that with your music, the money will come around sooner or later. It always has with me. And I went up and down, you know, I made a lot, spent it, screwed it up, went back and down, it never bothered me. Had a good time, no regrets. So, when was the first time you got to see the world outside of uh, Kaplan, Louisiana? Well, we moved to Winnie, Texas. My dad and his brothers were, he couldn't read and write, remember, so his, his job was very limited. He was a common laborer. And they had, in them days, before they had the combines that would, uh, you know, shell your rice and put it, you had separators, what they call separators, where they, they would ground and they would, they, would, they would blow a big haystack. And the rice would go in sacks, and you'd soak the sacks, and you'd pull them and take them to town. And uh, uh, so that uh, uh, those, those would, you know, before the combines and, and stuff ever came along, we did that work for you. So that, so way back then, it's where, you know, I learned where uh, I got off your question. Give it back to me. No, well, I was just uh, wondering when you got out of town. You said you moved to Winnie. Okay. My dad, in them days, you had to... In your old pictures, you see wheat and rice, you know, they'll have old pictures where you see the stacks, you know, and we used to call that shucking rice, and they had a combine, uh, a cutter that would cut it, and then they would wrap a, a twine around it and it would spit it out. Mm -hmm. And you came along with the uh, hook, it had a, a hook and a piece of wood, it's like a pick of bells of hay probably not. And you picked up that, and you had to be good at it, because you had to put that about five or six or seven I think with the with the grain leaning up and then cap it, break one of them up and cap it so that when the wind blew, it wouldn't blow the seeds in the uh, the end of the stalks that had the seeds in it in the water it would start to germinate before it would dry. So you had to be very good at doing that, you know. And my dad and his brothers were, were good at that. They were like six, seven brothers. So they moved to Texas and they started shucking rice for by the acre. For the rich man, so that uh, the reason we moved here is because to make a living, because we wasn't making a living over My dad was working on WPA and making three dollars a week. Uh, things had went down during the depression times, and I remember my dad. He had they gave him ten percent of the crop finally on rice, and and the uh, Kaplan rice mill was nine miles away, and him sitting there, uh, tears coming down his eyes because the rice wasn't worth cutting. You wouldn't have got enough even to pick to cut it to take it to the mill. God. And so that him being the, the little man that just killed him, you know. So that I remember that like it was yesterday. And because he was proud he had a good crop. He loved my dad was a, a close to nature man. He he thought that the only living for man was farming. 
And he thought if you weren't a farmer, well, then you'd lost it, you know. <laughs> and he was close, very close to nature, even though he couldn't read and write. He could tell you everything about nature. Well, what year did you move to Winnie? I can't remember. I was 12 years old. I'm 58 now, so you figure it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was pretty much your first exposure to the big world? Uh? Yeah. We, I remember coming into Texas on a truck that an uncle of mine had. And I remember coming through Beaumont, going to Winnie, I would, and they were paving one side of it. And the other side was gravel was riding on. And that amazed the shit out of me. I'll never forget, man. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out how people could afford to put concrete down like that for cars, just for cars to run over, you know? And I remember <laughs> being back there with my mom and my little brother's two years younger than me, and I said, and I said, I can't believe this, man. And I, just, I remember that like right out of Boomer. I remember that like Highway 224 is now, and uh, it runs right parallel in State 10. I'll never forget that on the way to Winnie. And I got to Winnie, and Winnie was an uh, all boom town. The gravel road ran out before we got to Wyndham. And man, it was like bogging down the horses and it would bog down on Main Street because it was a McCarthy. What was the uh, Glenn McCarthy? Mm -hmm. A boom town. He was there and he was working the old field right along with his men. He was known for that. And he, uh, and that's where everybody went to work at. And finally, you know, the, all, the rice fields were there and the all field beginning was there. And so it was. That's where we moved to, the winning. First time we moved to winning. Hmm. Well, uh, your dad set, started playing? He played, and he always played, you know, and played everywhere. That, the music was always part of my family. Was there any difference in the audience? I mean, it was a whole new thing. You're in winning. You're well, not in no, it was an enjoyment, you know. Uh, uh, people enjoyed their work like hell in the fields all day, and uh, it was like a release on the weekends, you know, for them. And Because uh, their common labor was from 4 in the morning to the... Uh, you couldn't go at night, you know, and, that, and you got paid whatever little bit you got paid, and they're glad to have a job. But those were your hours, they're from can to can't, they used to say. And uh, so that when we moved to Winning, we lived in the uh, shotgun house, and half of it was separated, and we lived on one side. I remember my uncle and his kids lived on the other side. And it was a steady fight between my mama and that woman. It was a shit, man. I'm, I remember that all the time, you know, disagreements. But uh, then the next time we moved, I guess it was about a year, we moved in a little house of our own, which was a shotgun shack. Again, it was about four bedroom, you know, including the two bedrooms and, you know, living room, the corridor, and the kitchen. And that's, that's went on, you know, music went on. Okay, so you, you drummed in your dad's band occasionally, you know? Yeah, and then, then they would get some other guys would move in and start working in Rossville, and they could play a few instruments, but there was two or three pieces, you know. And then they would play, and everybody just, it was a good time, you know. Uh, my good times that I remember was making it, you know, uh, getting there. I'm having good times now, but I still remember them days as, as real good times. They were free times, you know. Whether that, I, my daddy probably had all the words, but I didn't have any. Would y'all get w just real wild, get... Oh, Saturday, well, the house Saturday down. Saturday night, man, you know, and, and them days was a matter of survival, you know. Uh, if somebody didn't get cut up or beat the shit out of somebody, some of the dance was considered bad. They didn't have a good time Saturday night, you know. And I was raised that way, too, in my in my young my young boy days. It was a matter of, you, you went to the dance to fight. That's how you was raised. You went to the dance to fight. And I liked it. <laughs> like, I got this shit beat out of me many times too, but I went back next weekend for some more. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, you got into radio uh, while you were living in Winnie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got into radio and then, you know, that's the time I went to grow and things became bigger. And uh, I got into radio by doing this jockey show. A guy that it was C.J. Bruce. Or in fact, he's still alive. He, I, I heard from him the other day. He runs a right across the rail, railroad track, uh, race track in Benton, Louisiana. He runs mm -hmm. a nightclub in Bengal. Day, getting real old, and he had a radio show, and he wanted to go open up a whole house in Eunice, Louisiana. <laughs> so he came to me, and I was always interested in that, you know, because French music, I liked it, so I knew. <laughs> so he got to me. So I'm just go open up a whole house in Eunice, and them days you work for the sheriff, for the sheriff on.